All right, perfect. So thank you everyone uh, for your patience and uh, please allow me to introduce our next and final speaker. And so uh, Alicia was born and raised in Fredericton and graduated from the University of New Brunswick with a bachelor's degree in interdisciplinary leadership and biology, and then migrated south to Belize in 2014 for five years, where she worked in tropical conservation and endangered species recovery. Now back in New Brunswick, Alicia connects people with nature across the province as the education manager for Nature New Brunswick and has been the lead on their Monarch project since 2019. So can I please have a warm welcome for Alicia. Thanks everyone and thanks Daniel for having me here today. I'm really excited to talk about Monarchs. Everyone that knows me knows that I love to go on and on about Monarchs, so this is great. So today we're going to be talking about nature and bees, monarch monitoring, um, monarch and milkweed monitoring project throughout southern New Brunswick, and a little bit about um, the threats that monarchs are facing, especially when it comes to habitat destruction here in New Brunswick and then elsewhere across their migratory range. So a little bit about nature and bee. We're a nonprofit charitable organization whose mission is to celebrate, conserve, and protect New Brunswick's natural heritage through education, networking, and collaboration. And one of our big projects um, that we work on is our Monarch Conservation and Awareness in Southern New Brunswick, which began in 2019. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. I apologize in advance as well. When I converted this presentation to PDF, some of the spacing kind of went a little bit wonky. So. That's why that looks like that. <laughs> so first I wanna talk a little bit about the significance of monarch butterflies. I'm assuming everyone here is probably at least a little bit familiar with monarch. They're a pretty iconic species, um, but they do have a lot of significance. The first being pollination. Um, so monarch, monarch butterflies, because adults feed on nectar, are considered pollinators. Um, and obviously, we all know without, without pollinators, a lot of really important food crops and other um, plant species that we depend on would cease to exist. Realistically speaking, <clears throat> monarch butterflies are not the most important pollinators for humans and the food sources that we depend on, but what they really represent um, as a pollinator species, in my opinion, is, is as an ambassador for the whole umbrella that pollinators cover because monarchs are a little bit more um, charismatic <laughs> in getting people to care about them compared to a wasp or a flower fly or something that's not as visually appealing but could still be just as important or more. So they're a really, really great ambassador species for all pollinators. Um, the other really interesting thing about monarchs and their significance is their migration. So they're unique amongst uh, most butterflies and other insects in that they have a uh, biannual migration of over 4,000 kilometers. So it's the largest, longest migration of any insect species that occurs on an annual basis. There are a few really interesting insects that will have a slightly longer migration, but it only occurs every several years, like it uh, doesn't happen every single year. <clears throat> so what's also kind of interesting about monarchs, not kind of, incredibly interesting about monarchs, is that there's a, the migratory generation is considered a super generation. So not all monarchs are capable of migration. And the way that that happens is our eastern population of monarch butterflies here will leave New Brunswick at really at this time of year from mid-August to early to October. There's still a few monarchs fluttering about in New Brunswick right now, especially since we've had some nice weather in September. And they'll fly all the way down to central Mexico. And then they'll spend the winters there, leave Mexico usually around March, fly back up to Texas and, and other southern U.S. states um, where they breed and then die. And it takes several more generations for those monarchs to reach back up to New Brunswick in the summertime. So only monarchs that um, it close 
uh, become butterflies after August 15th are considered to be capable here in New Brunswick, capable of migration all the way to Mexico. And they're bigger and they're stronger and they'll live seven to eight months versus four to six weeks as adults. So really fascinating life cycle in terms of the difference between a monarch that's born in September versus a monarch that's born in June. <clears throat> Um, <laughs> another really often, I think, forgotten about or not uh, fully appreciated significant, uh, significance of monarch butterflies is the cultural significance of monarchs. So probably my favorite fact about monarchs is that their migration to Mexico coincides with the Dia de las Muertas, Day of the Dead, that happens early November. And so for millennia, these butterflies were coming in millions, turning the skies orange, literally, in these areas of central Mexico. And they literally created an entire holiday around them because people still now will believe that the monarchs returning are the souls of their lost loved ones returning to celebrate with the living, um, which is really beautiful. And, and they're really still held in such high cultural regard um, even now. And it's really not just Mexico. A lot of other culturals, uh, or cultures in North America um, have a lot of spiritual beliefs surrounding butterflies in general and the fact that, um, you know, if a butterfly lands on your shoulder, maybe that's um, uh, some sort of message from a lost loved one or a beacon of hope or inspiration or metamorphosis or change, some sort of sign. So Really, butterflies to humans culturally have a really special importance. And I think in conservation and biology, we don't necessarily always um, give enough weight to that, that beauty of, of certain species because it is important. So now we're going to talk a little bit about their habitats. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about the migration um, as we go through monarch habitats too because, because they occupy such a large range between southern Canada and central Mexico. They have a lot of different uh, equally important habitats that they append, depend on. <clears throat> so the first is breeding habitat. So most people already um, understand the significance between monarchs and milkweed. Is everyone here at least familiar with the, the relationship that monarchs and milkweed have? Um, so breeding habitat occurs where milkweed is found. It's the only type of plant that monarch larvae will feed on. So this is a photo of common milkweed um, that I took in Fredericton. Um, we do have another type of um, milkweed that's native here in New Brunswick, swamp milkweed. Um, that's probably what you guys have planted in the, the garden here. Um, it tends to do a little bit better. We recommend it as a garden plant because it has a different root system and it tends to, I'll say, behave a little bit better in a garden setting because it stays where you plant it more so than common milkweed. Um, but they're equally useful to the monarchs. Uh, they don't really seem to prefer swamp over common or vice versa. Um, and in addition to milkweed, um, what really makes breeding habitat um, more appealing to monarchs is the presence of other nectar producing flowers because the adults will feed on nectar. They don't actually feed on um, the milkweed in the same way that the larvae do. Um, when flowers are blooming like this, monarchs will nectar from them on milkweed, but they're only blooming from mid-June um, through July, generally speaking. And so in those kind of shoulder seasons that we have monarchs here, it's really important to have a lot of other nectar producing wildflowers or garden flowers that will attract them to the milkweed as well. So a little bit about um, where we have breeding habitat and where we have monarchs in New Brunswick. Um, this information was taken from iNaturalist. Maybe I'll come over here. Am I still on camp? Yeah, I yeah. am. Okay. Um, this information was taken from iNaturalist, which we'll talk about um, in a little bit here. 
Um, but you can see, generally speaking, the, this is a graph of adult and immature monarch butterflies found in New Brunswick. Um, and then this is a graph of swamp and common milkweed found in New Brunswick. So you can see, generally speaking, the range is kind of in the southern half of New Brunswick. Um, monarchs aren't very commonly found in, say, like Campbellton um, or Bathurst areas or even Edmondson. Um, so really they're concentrated in the southern half of New Brunswick and where we're finding monarchs is pretty, um, you know, the overlap between where we're seeing milkweed and where we're seeing monarchs is, is pretty stark. <clears throat> so now threats to the breeding habitat. Um, the first threat, and really this exists too, I should, I should mention breeding habitat doesn't just exist here in New Brunswick. There's breeding habitat for monarchs from southern Texas all the way up to New Brunswick. So when they're migrating northward again, they're breeding and nectaring the entire way up. Um, so all of these threats affect breeding habitat along that entire journey. Um, some affect certain areas more than others. One of the really, really sensitive areas is those first milkweed patches that monarchs are, are flying towards when they leave Mexico, because if those disappear, they might not have the energy after having spent the entire winter in Mexico waiting for the right conditions to leave and breed again to make it that much farther. Um, so probably one of the biggest threats is um, widespread herbicide and pesticide use, especially across farmland in central um, and southern U.S. states. Um, but that doesn't mean that it's not an, an issue here as well. So even, even things like using um, herbicides and pesticides on your, your garden plants can have the ability to affect monarchs. We actually saw um, this summer, I don't know if anyone's aware of it, if anyone has, had been buying milkweed at nurseries, but there is a really widespread problem really all over the US and Canada with certain milkweed distributors having sprayed their plant, the milkweed plants um, with uh, either a herbicide or pesticide before sending them out to the smaller greenhouses that distributed them. And so people were buying swamp milkweed right here in New Brunswick for their monarchs and the greenhouses didn't know that it had been sprayed with pesticides and um, lots of people lost caterpillars that had been laid on them because as they're consuming the milkweed, they're obviously consuming um, the toxin as well. And um, that's killing them just like any other insect. So pesticides um, are really indiscriminate and um, obviously not good for monarchs or other pollinators. Uh, another obvious risk is urban and agricultural development. Um, the reason that this really uh, tends to affect milkweed in particular is that milkweed, especially common milkweed, likes to grow in very disturbed areas um, and will pop up a lot in agricultural fields. And so it's a little bit of a battle um, in terms of leaving enough milkweed for the monarchs. Um, and obviously having farmland to, to produce the crops and food that we, we need as humans. Um, a third risk to breeding habitat is mowing. Um, so again, common milkweed likes really sunny, for lack of a better word, kind of crappy, <laughs> sandy soil. And so it'll pop up a lot here in New Brunswick, especially on roadsides and uh, along trail systems and in ditches. And um, it, it can be mowed with regular trail and road maintenance to maintain visibility. Um, now we're, we're talking about climate change um, because what does this not affect? <laughs> um, droughts are becoming more frequent. Um, and again, we're seeing the droughts affecting monarchs in the beginning of their northward migration. And so um, if droughts 
are preventing milkweed and nectar sources from coming up in the southern U.S. early on in the year. It can prevent um, a large portion of monarchs from continuing to migrate northward. Um, and then on the flip side, when they start to migrate southward again, if we're seeing droughts this time of year farther in the, the U.S., farther south, um, they don't have enough nectar sources to make it all the way to Mexico. Um, a lot of uh, extreme temperature fluctuations, so um, periods of uh, cold, especially again when they're migrating um, to Mexico at this time of year. If we have a cold snap, monarchs are really sensitive to cold, um, and so a lot can die off. Um, similarly, during their breeding um, period, if there's a lot of high temperatures, caterpillars are sensitive to that, and so that can cause mortality in caterpillars. Um, also just changes in blooming times and floral resource availability. Because monarchs have this really fascinating migration, um, and that super generation is cued by the natural changes in day length and temperature, they're really sensitive to any fluctuation in that, and that can trigger migration either earlier or later, which could affect their ability to make it to Mexico. So this photo actually shows um, a, an agricultural field that, had, that was full of milkweed um, that had just been mowed, and this was kind of along the barrier that they'd left, and you can see this milkweed plant. Oop, this is really sensitive. <laughs> I won't touch it. This milkweed plant uh, was caught by the mower, and it actually had a little caterpillar on it. So you can imagine a field that's mowed with milkweed after a monarch has come and laid her eggs um, can cause a lot of die-off in caterpillars. <clears throat> okay, so now we're gonna talk about staging habitat. Um, this is one of the habitats that um, is getting a lot of attention right now, and I think it's because it's been, um, it hasn't been given as much attention as milkweed and breeding habitat has in the past. So staging habitat occurs in specific areas along the monarch's migratory route where late blooming wildflowers are in abundance. Um, these stops are essential refueling and rest stops for large numbers of monarchs during migration. And monarchs will visit staging areas each year to rest, feed, and avoid bad weather. So these are areas that have um, a significant amount of floral resources that are in really particular geographic locations, generally happening before the monarch needs to make like a, their next big leg of their migration, um, similar to birds um, or some migratory birds. <clears throat> um, so in New Brunswick and um, those areas would be along the Bay of Fundy. So when they jump over the Bay of Fundy to continue on into Maine and uh, farther down the East Coast. So uh, we know of two staging areas at the moment in New Brunswick, but this is kind of like a new area where we're looking for, it seems that monarchs follow the same migratory route each year and it's a specific route. Um, and so we're looking for these really significant areas because they support that migrating population of monarchs. Um, and I'll tell you what those two areas are on the slide after next. <laughs> um, so staging habitat is identified by the presence of monarchs in mid-August through September in New Brunswick. Um, those dates will change depending on the geographic region, but those are specific to New Brunswick. Um, it's generally accompanied by roosting behavior. So monarchs technically will migrate alone, um, but they'll congregate in large groups at specific stops. Um, and in those large groups, they'll roost. So this is a, a photo that was taken actually this month at Irving Nature Park. It's um, the first as far as I know, um, incidents of a roost this size being photographed in New Brunswick. So this is, if anyone knows <laughs> of monarchs that are congregating like this, this time of year, um, please let us know because it's something that we're trying to uh, better understand right now. 
Um, so like I said, there's two sites that have been documented in New Brunswick so far that are really well, um, I shouldn't say really well studied, but um, have been monitored to some degree. So the first is Point La Pro Bird Observatory. Um, so that's right here. So you can see the St. John River, um, the Wollastook, would kind of come out here. And the kind of prevailing theory right now is that monarchs in New Brunswick will follow the river valley down to the coast and then fly along the, the coast of the Bay of Fundy right here down to this headland, which is Point La Pro, and then jump across to Grand Manan, and then we're assuming jump across to Maine again. So not surprisingly, the two roost areas, or sorry, staging areas that have had kind of the most action that we're the most aware of in New Brunswick are here at Point La Pro and Southwest Head Lighthouse on Grand Manan. So if you were to visit either of those areas, um, usually we see like the, the highest incidence of migration um, the first two weeks of September. So we're seeing hundreds of monarchs fly through those areas um, a day, um, which is really unlike anywhere else in New Brunswick that we know of at this point. Again, if anyone has seen something similar, please let me know because we are still trying to figure out where these really significant locations are for monarchs. So the threats to staging habitats, um, there is quite a bit of overlap with breeding habitat threats. So again, widespread herbicide and pesticide use, um, urban and agricultural development again, and then climate change um, in the same sense as with breeding populations. Um, but one really additional um, factor that we can't ignore is hurricane season and how it coincides with the monarch migration. And we, when you think of a really delicate butterfly and then a big hurricane like Hurricane Fiona that we just had come through, it does, you know, it doesn't take much imagination to imagine how that can really affect monarchs that are trying to make it back down south and blow them off course. <clears throat> and really, in some ways, this is more sensitive habitat because with breeding habitat, it seems like wherever there's milkweed, the monarchs are going to find it. Whereas with staging habitat, since monarchs seem to follow a very specific migratory route. If a staging area, you know, um, was developed and all of the floral resources went away at that spot and we relocated them over here, we don't necessarily know that the monarchs are going to change their migratory route accordingly. So they might just end up, you know, flying over that area and maybe fewer of them will have the energy to make it to the next stop uh, than, than they would originally. <clears throat> the last habitat that I'll talk about today is overwintering habitat. It's not found in New Brunswick, so we can't do a whole lot about it in terms of its protection, but it's still important because um, in some ways this is the most sensitive habitat to monarchs. Um, so. Again, our eastern population of monarchs will migrate all the way to central Mexico, um, and they overwinter in these Oyamel fir forests in the Sierra Madre mountain range. Um, and they, they come in the um, hundreds of millions. There is an unbelievable number of butterflies, so much so that uh, we can't actually count the number of butterflies. So instead, the population is measured by the area, the, the, um, the number of hectares that butterflies are seen to cover from above. So kind of looks like there's maybe like a forest fire or something going on in this photo. It's not. That's the monarch butterflies on these OML fir trees. <clears throat> so there are some smaller overwintering areas um, in California for the western population of monarchs. Um, on the other side of the Rocky Mountains, there's a smaller population that will migrate um, a shorter distance, usually between southern British Columbia um, and southern California. 
um, and some of them don't migrate at all. And Florida, there's uh, a lot of weird things biologically going on in Florida, and monarchs are one of them. It seems like there's, um, there's a now wintering population of monarchs, a small wintering population of monarchs in South Florida, um, and some evidence that there's a, a year-round population there as well. But by and large, the biggest population is our eastern migratory population that goes between southern Canada and central Mexico. So this habitat is um, like Goldilocks habitat. It's not too hot. It's not too cold. There's a constant cool breeze that will keep um, the monarchs at a, um, a temperature that allows them to maintain um, this state of diapause where they're not breeding and they're not um, exerting a lot of energy or using a lot of resources. They're just waiting until conditions are favorable to fly north again and, and once again breed and complete the cycle. Um, there's lots of shelter in these fir trees um, and lots of water sources too for them. They do, they will kind of fly a little bit, flutter around on sunnier days and nectar a little bit, but generally speaking, they're just clustered in these trees and dense enough clumps that um, sometimes the weight of the butterflies will actually bow the branches of the, the fir trees, which is kind of hard to really reconcile, <laughs> I think, in, in your mind how, um, how butterflies could have that effect on anything that big. So some of the threats to, there's a lot of threats here um, for monarchs, unfortunately. Um, a lot of illegal logging goes on in some of these refuges for monarchs. Um, climate change, another, you know, another um, huge threat to them. There was actually a storm in January of 2002 that brought 10 centimeters of snow um, to this specific region and killed 74% of monarchs in Sierra Chinqua and 81% of monarchs in El Rosario overwintering sites, um, which are the two biggest overwintering sites for monarchs in the Sierra Madres. And so all of these butterflies on the ground here are dead. Apparently it was like, um, like 10 inches of monarchs in some areas just dead on the ground. So you can see how an extreme weather event like that could potentially have the, the ability to wipe out the whole population just like that. Um, so this is really where we're seeing um, probably the most extreme risk of climate change threats to monarchs. So now a little bit about the status of monarchs um, of our Eastern population. So it's declined by an estimated 84% from 1996 to 2014. Um, and like I said, they're monitored by measuring the area covered by monarchs and their overwintering grounds. The target for recovery for monarchs is a sustained population of 6.05 hectares. So we actually reached that in 2018, 2019. These numbers are usually counted um, I think it's, it's either December or January. Um, so there's one year in the, in the recent past that that level was reached, but you can see this past year um, was a lot, is the lowest since 2015 at 2.1 hectares covered. And there's so many factors, even if we have a really good year for monarchs here in New Brunswick, there's so many factors along our migratory range that can impact what their population looks like in the overwintering grounds. Um, so that creates a lot, of, um, a lot of difficulties with um, their management plans and uh, really underscores the um, necessity for the conservation of monarchs to be a, a tri-national effort between Mexico, the US, and Canada. So I have another graph here and you can see, even though there's been a lot of spikes and dips, you can see that the overall trend of monarchs has been decreasing at a general rate. Um, so 
we'll go over a little bit about their status internationally and then provincially as well um, because that tends to cause a lot of confusion about monarchs. So there's so many <laughs> um, um, governing bodies at different levels that assign um, statuses to species at risk that it can be confusing. So the International Union for the Conservation of Nature listed monarchs as endangered this past summer. Um, so that's on an international level, but um, here in Canada doesn't really hold any legal uh, implications. Um, Cause CWIC, the Committee on the Status of Endangered Wildlife in Canada, listed monarchs as endangered in 2016. The Federal Species at Risk Act that actually makes um, policies surrounding species at risk still lists uh, monarchs as special concern, and that's been since 2003. So that's a lower classification; doesn't um, involve as much protection. Um, and actually, just the date's wrong on this, it was July 27th, but the Provincial Species at Risk Act here in New Brunswick just um, increased the monarch listing to endangered, um, so that's good. So hopefully that will mean that at least here in New Brunswick, we'll continue to do our part to make sure that monarch populations continue ex to exist for future generations. Um, how am I doing on time? Okay. I'll finish up quickly <laughs> to give time for questions if there are any. Um, so a little bit about uh, what we can all do to, to help monarch populations here um, and what we are doing at Nature NB. Um, the first is by creating or maintaining habitat. So like Kate Germain, um, plant some milkweed in your yard and don't neglect um, the other nectar producing flowers that will attract the adults and continue to nourish the adults so they can lay lots of eggs. Um, avoid using pesticides and herbicides. Um, and Nature NB actually gives away swamp milkweed seeds. I have some with me here today. So if anyone would like to plant swamp milkweed in your garden at home or on a property that you have, um, I can give you some. This is a great time of year to plant them directly outside into the soil. Because they're a native plant here, they need actually a period of cold to germinate properly in the spring. Um, so if you'd like to plant, plant them in the spring, what we suggest is to recreate that period of cold in your fridge a few weeks before planting, um, and we have directions to do that. So directly outside at this time of year, or you can start them inside in the spring with some help from the fridge. Um, another thing that you can do is encourage municipal action. Um, so the National Wildlife Federation in the U.S., and the David Suzuki Foundation in Canada have created a program called the Mayor's Monarch Pledge. And that's encouraging municipalities to very simply, they have to, there's a list of about 60 action items to support monarch conservation. And um, municipalities have to implement three actions a year. They're really not that difficult. A lot of municipalities are already doing some of this stuff for general pollinator conservation. Um, and in our experience, it's been kind of um, an, an easy PR move for municipalities because people love monarchs. I really haven't met a single person um, in doing this project that like has felt negatively towards monarch butterflies. They're pretty easy to like. Um, so it's a nice thing for municipalities to do. And currently Hampton, New Brunswick is the only municipality in New Brunswick that has officially signed the pledge. So it would be great to get some new municipalities involved. And if you have any suggestions or connections with municipalities outside of Hampton, please let me know. And uh, I'd love to um, get more municipal involvement. Um, and the last thing that you can do is take part in community science. So community science initiatives allow for data to be collected at much larger scales um, and help researchers, policymakers, and environmental groups inform conservation decision making. So um, I'll talk a little bit about the community science initiatives that we are really um, encouraging folks to use and monitoring from our end. Um, but the reason um, that we're really encouraging these is because monarchs traditionally, as we've talked about, the populations have only really been measured in their overwintering sites and there's a lot of other stuff going on during the year. So it's really important to get as 
uh, accurate of a snapshot as we can in different areas along their migratory range to see how breeding populations are doing in the summer and where there could be um, things going right or things going wrong. Um, so there's iNaturalist. Is everyone familiar with iNaturalist? Okay. <laughs> Milkweed Watch is another one. Um, e Butterfly, Monarch Watch, and um, Mission Monarch through um, the Montreal Insectarium. Today I'm just going to talk about iNaturalist and Mission Monarch for now, but if you have questions about, oh, and actually Monarch Watch too. So those three, but if you have questions about Milkweed Watch or E Butterfly, let me know afterwards. Um, so if everyone's familiar with iNaturalist, I'll glaze over this. Um, but essentially, it's an app where you can record any living species that you can see with the naked eye um, anywhere in the world. And it's the most popular communi community science app. And um, I think most conservation organizations, at least in New Brunswick, use iNaturalist regularly to see, you know, species of interest um, and where they've been cited in New Brunswick. <clears throat> so um, that just goes over a little bit how to um, upload an observation, which I'll skip over because everyone seems comfortable. But if, again, in the questions, if you have questions about this, please ask. Um, but I just wanted to talk about our Monarch and Milkweed in New Brunswick project. So anytime a Monarch is uploaded to iNaturalist, it automatically gets added to this project that Nature NB runs, and the same with swamp or common milkweed. So it gives us a really good idea of where people are seeing these species in New Brunswick. Um, so, so far we have a total of 1,300 observations between monarchs, common milkweed, and swamp milkweed. Um, and every year we're seeing more and more, which is really great. So there's 538 observations on iNaturalist of those three species in 2022 compared with 242 in 2021. And the more the merrier, we really want ideally everyone who has an interest in monarchs to be uploading whenever they see one. Um, so again, just because we've been able to um, encourage more folks to use iNaturalist for monarchs, um, these maps actually came from the Monarch Status Report um, that was written for the province in 2022. So if you've uploaded a, a, an observation of Monarch or Milkweed to iNaturalist up to date, um, it has been used in an actual conservation report. This, this data is um, genuinely useful. Um, it's not just a, a way to tick a box for a funder or anything. We, we need it. Um, and then the other um, community science application that we're heavily encouraging in the summer is Mission Monarch. Um, so Mission Monarch is a little bit more work intensive in that um, it's looking for actual surveys to be done where someone will go out and um, check every stem or as many stems as possible of milkweed in a milkweed field for eggs, caterpillars, and adult butterflies, and chrysalis if you find them. Um, and then the, that data is uploaded to uh, a portal online that's shared trinationally with Mexico and the US. Um, and the really important dates that we're asking folks to, to use Mission Monarch is um, usually the last, between the last week of July and the first week of August, there's an international monarch monitoring blitz where people across the monarch's breeding range in the summertime are asked to upload this data so that we can, we can have a snapshot of what monarchs are doing at that specific time the entire way across their um, breeding range. So this year, uh, we, we led 18 community blitzes with Mission Monarch. So if you'd like a community blitz in your area next year, let me know. Um, we also offer French and English virtual blitz leader training webinars. So Mission Monarch will actually put on a webinar every year for us. Um, if you would like to lead a blitz in your community or you would like to do a blitz, that will train you on how to collect the data. Um, so to date, there's been 455 surveys of milkweed, um, which equals a total of 25,951 milkweed plants 
inspected. Um, and in this year alone, we inspected 10,706. So just like with iNaturalist, we're incrementally increasing, almost exponentially increasing the, the number of blitzes and plants that we're checking every year. Lastly, I'll talk about Monarch Watch. So Monarch Watch um, is the organization that actually tags butterflies. And um, this is how we're actually able to say with um, certainty that monarchs that leave New Brunswick um, actually make it all the way down to Mexico. Um, so those dead butterflies that you saw in that slide, mortality is normal every year. That was just an extreme case. So um, folks are actually employed in Mexico to kind of search through any dead butterflies on the ground and look for tagged individuals. And then this tag number will correspond to the location, um, uh, who tagged it, um, what weather conditions were like, different things like that. Um, so we tag butterflies, actually the St. John Naturalist Club as part of our monarch conservation project, tags hundreds of monarchs every year at Point La Pro and Southwest Head, the other staging area I mentioned. Um, so if you ever see a monarch butterfly this time of year with a tag on it and you have a good camera and you can um, take a photo of it, that will also help us kind of determine the migratory uh, paths of monarchs in New Brunswick, for instance, if we, um, if someone tagged a monarch in um, Moncton, let's say, and then we caught it and uh, recorded that tag number at Point La Pro, we would know that mo monarchs from Moncton are coming through Point La Pro. And so there has been a little bit of information like that gleaned. Um, and actually two monarchs have been recovered in Mexico that were tagged in Point La Pro, which is really exciting. So we definitely know that our New Brunswick monarchs in some number at least, are getting to Mexico. I think they were both tagged at El Rosario, um, that site that in 2002 had the actual highest mortality rate of butterflies. Um, so that's it for me. I just wanted to acknowledge Environment and Climate Change Canada for funding this project, um, the Wildlife Trust Fund, Environmental Trust Fund, and Nature Canada. Does anyone have any questions? Well, first of all, I'd just like to jump in and say thank you so much, Alicia, for that fantastic presentation. Maybe if I can just get a, a round of applause. And uh, I, I have a question, and there's one here in the chat, and then I can hand around the microphone. Um, I, I was actually surprised. I was under the impression that monarchs, you know, migrated down uh, generationally. And then it wasn't the actual one born here in New Brunswick that would be found down in Mexico. So they do actually like a single butterfly. From yeah. Here yeah. Wow. That's, yeah. That's it's quite really, a journey. It seems impossible. Um, but like I said, like we have literal proof that monarchs that were tagged in Point La Pro have made it to Mexico. Um, and they're actually when you, um, when we're tagging butterflies, um, you can actually almost feel this super migratory generation is, is actually bigger and stronger than the generations that have come before it that year. And so they, it almost feels like the wings have like little bones in them. Like they're really built for long distance flight. And do they do that in one season? Yeah. So they don't do it in, in different seasons? Uh, no, they'll only, so they migrate um, each latitude depending on, so, I think sometimes we tend to think of their migration as being two ways, which it is in a sense, um, but monarchs that um, as they move northwards during the year, some will stay. So there, there's going to be monarchs year round in Texas and North Carolina and New Jersey, all the way up their migratory range. So some will stay and some will continue to migrate northward. And so it happens slowly over um, two to three generations before they reach back to New Brunswick. Um, but it's only the fourth or fifth generation of the year that is the migratory generation. And um, the genes that, that cause them to be able to live longer, to be bigger, to be stronger, we think are turned on by environmental cues. 
Um, and so that happens at different times of the year, depending on the latitude. So our monarchs that um, eclose from their chrysalis as adults um, after August 15th are considered to be the migratory generation. Um, but somewhere like, um, let's say, North or South Carolina is going to have a later date for that in the year where those genes are turned on and, and all of a sudden uh, migratory monarchs are eclosing. Does that make sense? <laughs> okay. And, and I, just a question on here, and I think this has already been addressed, but from Bonnie Lee, have any of the monarchs uh, tagged at Point La Probe been spotted in the staging area on Grand Manan? Yes, actually, yeah. I think there's been a couple um, that, that kind of, um, I don't want to say confirms, but, um, you know, adds credit to the, the hypothesis that they're, kind of using Graham and Ann as like a little bit of a stepping stone to get across the Bay of Fundy. And you can actually, when you look at, um, when you're at the, the point on Point Lapro, you can see Graham and Ann in the distance. And then when you're at Southwest Head Lighthouse, we haven't had any um, confirmation in Maine that, that monarchs tagged at Southwest Head are arriving to this location in Maine, but you can see Maine from, Southwest Head Lighthouse, and it looks to be about the same distance as Point La Pro to Graham and Ann. So it seems like they're doing that little hop. Good. That's the one I saw Paul there first. So, no, Andrew? No, no, go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. The single generation thing is exciting news. Yeah. Uh, as uh, you've been saying. Uh, I'm, I'm curious about uh, monarch sightings uh, outside your responsibility here in New Brunswick. Do you, do you know if there are regular sightings in PEI? Are they throughout Nova Scotia? Um, I know that there, that PEI, as far as I understand, um, they're rare sightings, but they don't, that they don't, um, regularly cross the Northumberland Strait. That's my understanding that they're not as common and there could be fluctuations year to year, but my understanding is that they're not as common in PEI as they are in Brunswick. Um, and as far as I know in Nova Scotia, I'm not sure about like Cape Breton, um, but I know in Southwest Nova Scotia, they are common and there have been a couple of staging areas as well documented in Nova Scotia and Southwest Nova Scotia where they're doing the same thing and crossing the Bay and congregating in larger groups. So part of my curiosity was uh, what information do we have about their crossing water? And you're partly answering that. Yeah, so there are a lot of other staging areas that are a lot better documented in different parts of North America. For instance, Point Pelly um, in um, Ontario, right. where they're crossing the great, one of the Great Lakes. I think, I don't know if it's, is it Lake Ontario? Does anyone know? Erie. But, Lake Erie, okay, yeah. So they're crossing Lake Erie and congregating in honestly much larger numbers than what we'd be seeing at Point La Pro. Um, so that's very well documented there. And then also Cape May, New Jersey is a really well documented. And there's a lot of overlap for any birders. Those are yeah. really like well birded areas where like birds are using them in the same kind of way. So it's not a huge surprise that Cape May, they're doing the same thing. It's a headland. They're kind of getting funneled in and then making that jump over the water um, onto more of the Southern states. A uh, related sighting. Uh, that lies somewhere deeper in my memory. I don't know if Andrew will remember this. We both have been active at one time or another in a local naturalist club based in Sackville. And when we would reach out a little further than the Tantramar area, we would occasionally go down into Nova Scotia. I'm thinking particularly of trips to Cape Door. A Cape it, depending on your geography, we're talking about the North Shore of the Minas okay. Basin, uh, where it leads out to the end point of that peninsula uh -huh. between Minas Basin and, and Chignecto Bay. Uh, we were there interested in birds and plants, and what should happen as we're scrambling down the cliff 
Others in the room will know that you have to go down to get to the Cape Door Lighthouse. If there was a substantial flight of monarchs, in this case, not a single. There was. Okay. But, I mean, not just 10, you know, hundred, hundreds. And we were noticing it because there was a stiff wind coming up the bay. And the monarchs were making their way down the cliff to about the point of the lighthouse. They would launch, and then the wind would pick them up, and they would, they would be carried all the way back oh. up the cliff a ways. And there was this, yeah. this, this uh, uh, you know, sad vortex <laughs> going here where they were wasting a lot of energy trying to launch themselves. That's... Um... That's really fascinating for a few reasons. Um, one, I'm definitely, I'll talk to you afterwards if you're okay and write this down. Um, I'm not sure if that region has been visited. I know in Nova Scotia they're doing the same kind of things as we are and visiting areas that they think might be used for staging during migration. Um, so last year was actually the first year that they did that, but that's going to be a continuing process. Um, and a lot of the, the um, the ways that we've like found these staging areas and that they've identified some of the staging areas in Nova Scotia is from historical anecdotes like that where people have seen them. And even if they're not, that's not happening anymore, that's, it's still important to know that it once was. Um, but the way that you're talking about this <clears throat> vortex is really interesting too, because that is something that we have seen at Point La Pro where it looks like, um, you know, I don't know if intelligence is necessarily, necessarily the right word to use, but, but monarchs seem to be, um, you know, um, like most animals, like very um, conscious of energy conservation. And so they're like waiting for the right time to, to make these longer legs of their journey. And so um, what usually happens, um, and Jim Wilson, for anyone who knows, yeah. Jim is like um, one of the, the monarch um, wizards. <laughs> and he runs with really, he, he has been monitoring them for years and has a whole wealth of knowledge in terms of what he's observed with monarchs. And, and um, he created the relationship with Point La Pro and, has, and started that monitoring process at Point La Pro. And so he's noticed that after a west wind, the point gets flooded with monarchs. And so they're, they're waiting for conditions to blow them down and make their flight easier. And then the same thing kind of happens when um, they're, they're waiting for like a, south, a southwest wind to blow them yeah. to Graham and Ann, or to not necessarily blow them, but you know, help them, help them fly to Graham and Ann. And so, um, when we've been at the point, you, you do kind of see um, sometimes like one at a time, a trickle before you see more go off. But the first couple of monarchs will kind of fly off the point, see if conditions are right, and then either continue on or be like, nope, and then <laughs> not come back <laughs> again. Right, like, right. Not yet. <laughs> yeah. yeah um, so that's really interesting. Yeah. And they're, um, they're known to, to migrate. Um, alone, but there's definitely, um, you know, conditions anyways that, that cause like m migration to happen in like a larger group. Yeah, at these areas. So that's really interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Did you want that? <clears throat> I know, <clears throat> excuse me, I noticed in your uh, earlier slide, uh, showing Florida as a as a potential wintering site. Yeah, I can go back to that if you want. When you get something like Ian that wiped out yeah. a part of most of southern on, uh, Florida, possibility of of wiping that contingent out would be quite uh, possible, I suppose. Uh, this time it's probably a little early for them because they're still probably moving down in the southern states. Yeah. But uh, the hurricane season does last into the uh, yeah. uh, early winter. So you could easily, in a situation like that, I suppose I, even the ones in, in Mexico yeah. could be uh, vulnerable to that kind of a uh, yeah, definitely. natural issue. Yeah. Um, and the thing with monarchs is that 
obviously severe weather, I mean, I'm, we're, we're here for a climate change talk, so there's no one who I'm sure in this room denies that it's happening. Um, and severe weather is becoming more frequent, and that's really, um, as far as I understand, the, the issue where like monarchs have been around for a very long time and have been doing this migration for a long time, and so there's um, evolutionary kind of things built in for some severe events where the population is able to bounce back. Um, so. Um, a female monarch, for instance, will, could lay over 500 eggs in her lifetime, one single female monarch. So there's like the, the potential for relatively quick um, population rebound after a severe event, if other conditions allow that to happen. But when you get a severe event that could impact overwintering grounds in Mexico, like the storm in 2002, um, plus a drought in Texas that, that you know, prevents nectar sources from being um, in, you know, the level of abundance that the monarchs would require um, as they're migrating northward, like that's where the problems start to occur or um, major milkweed destruction or pesticide use along those, those really key areas. Um, in some ways, in New Brunswick, where we're at the like very northern end of their range. To an extent, even if we did everything wrong, the population could still, if we were the only ones kind of messing up the monarchs, the population could still exist elsewhere. Um, so even though monarch conservation is, I think, necessary here for um, the sake of this, the, you know, our, love of the species, these lower areas are the really, really critical ones. I hope that doesn't sound too pessimistic <laughs> about them, but. It's kind of interesting, the migration patterns that you show, though that the orange lines on there, they don't cross the Appalachians. Yeah. <clears throat> Oh, here. Yeah, there, yeah. Yeah, so it seems like monarchs, we know that they don't cross the Rocky Mountains, so these are considered, this is considered one population of Eastern monarchs, and then this is an entirely separate population of the Western monarchs. Um, and I think at some point, because these will go down to Mexico, there's, um, you know, genetic mixing of the monarchs here, um, but they do tend to follow landscape um, and, and uh, natural landscapes, which is one of the reasons why we have this hypothesis that they follow um, the St. John Wollstock River for their migration as well. It's interesting to see that like on the map, so obviously. Uh, so there doesn't seem to be any uh, crossover between the Western population and the Eastern. Mm -mm. Are they distinguishable uh, uh, DNA wise? I know? think that they would be. Yeah, I yeah. don't know 100% because for they've sure, been geographically but, separated yeah, for so long. Yeah, but I, I, um, I, as I understand them, they are considered yeah. to be two distinct populations. Yeah. Um, we have uh, several batches of swamp milkweed, but I noticed this year our two older batches. I didn't notice them at all until just recently, when they're, they're starting to. Well, a couple of weeks ago, maybe you started to notice the plants, whereas the most recent batch that we had flowered and seed, and actually a few days ago, the seeds were floating around mm -hmm. for, the, for the first time. I hadn't noticed them before floating around. Um, do they prefer to be on their own? Because I have a feeling they're being out-competed. The two older batches oh, okay. being out-competed by uh, rose bushes or lilacs and, and things. Should we be planting them on their own? And should they have more southerly exposure, perhaps? Uh, these are sort of on the north side of flower beds, but I mean, they're still. I, feel, I, would, I would say southerly exposure would um, probably be a little worse for them because they would dry out faster. So okay. I think one of the reasons um, swamp milkweed has a different root system than um, 
common does. Common milkweed has rhizomes and it, it'll spread underground. Swamp milkweed has a, a taproot. Tap mm -hmm. um, but I think one of the reasons too, and this is partially just from my own experience um, and seeing it growing wild um, versus in my own garden, um, probably doesn't come as a surprise. It seems that swamp milkweed likes a wetter ground. Yeah. <laughs> and so I think in a garden, even though it does well, you, um, for me particularly, like I only had to water my swamp milkweed a couple of times this summer and okay. the like heat, the really high heat of July. Um, so it does like, it does need a little bit more tending to than like common milkweed, for instance, where it grows in full sun, sandy soil right, right and it all it'll do its thing yeah. so it might be a good idea to plant them in in ditches where it might be a little moister Definitely. in general it would do yeah. really well there yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah cool i don't know if that means though just just so you know i don't know if that means that it would spread more in those areas uh, if, um yeah, yeah that's, that's the, something you're not looking yeah, for yeah. so maybe it would behave a little bit uh more unpredictably when it when the conditions are just right for it so and, and so you mentioned planting the seeds now would, would be uh, a good time to do it. And then we don't have to go through the, oh, how long do I leave them in the yeah. fridge in? Yeah. So if we just, would you plant them in, in a, a quite shallow soil or? You uh, can, um, you can sprinkle them on the soil yeah. this time of year and just leave them be. The rate of germination that you're going to see isn't going to be as high because, um, you know, little squirrels and birds and stuff like that will get to them. Um, but you can do that. And I just kind of gently cover them with soil if you want them to be a Gen little bit just more. A, 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 yeah, a, because a, a, they can freeze. They, and, and that's okay for and them. And that's okay for them. Yeah. yeah you um, don't actually have and, to sow them. Do you have to take the fluff off or does it matter? You can just, I imagine it, naturally I they'd have the it. fluff on. Yeah, I think you can just leave it. All of the seeds that we give out have have the fluff removed. <laughs> so yes. you don't have to worry about that. But if you were taking from your own pod, I would kind of um, just sprinkle the seeds yeah. wherever. Yeah. yeah. The thing with if the fluff's still on it and it doesn't have any soil on top, wind might take it away and That's bring right. it somewhere else. But yeah. 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 Sure. Um, if you want, if you wanted, say, um, for someone who didn't have any swamp milkweed in their garden and they like really want some this following summer, I would recommend starting them inside because um, the germination rate that you can get with them that way is like 90%. It's really, mm -hmm. really high. Um, they're really hardy. You can start them in little, you know, individual pots and when they're a few inches big and the weather is good. You can transplant them outside and so they'll take off. You, you would do that in the spring? Yeah. 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 And I what? actually, um, we're kind of playing around to the instructions right now on the milkweed seeds um, are to um, put them in like a damp paper towel and um, put them in the fridge for six to eight weeks and then take them out and sow them. Um, I've experimented with because I'm someone when I, if I did that in the the fridge I'm forgetting about like there's no way I remember that in eight yeah. weeks I like would find that six months later and be like yeah. <laughs> no. um, so uh, what I've been trying is um, to dry stratify them so instead of having the moisture in the fridge you just take the bag and put it directly in the freezer where there's no moisture in the bag and they actually do freeze and I've had success doing that for a week in the freezer and then, and then planting them inside and they come up. Right. Yeah, okay. so that's another option. And so when would you plant them inside? In uh, May or even earlier? I've planted them um, over the last couple of years. I've planted some late and I've planted some really early and I kind of experimented last year and I planted them in early March thinking like, well, oh, maybe, maybe I'm going to affect the like normal cycle of things because days are still really short and they got kind of laggy, um, but they came up well and it didn't affect them. So I and, think that's and, totally and then you, too. you only put them in the outside in, in when the weather was June so good. or something. Yeah. But I have heard, you know, you know, they're really hardy plants, so you can kind of get creative with them and experiment with them if you want to. Um, I've heard of people also doing um, 
what do they call it? Is it winter planting or something? Has anyone heard of this? When you put them, when you like plant a seed, you create kind of like almost a greenhouse with a plastic bag or a plastic um, dome over the pot and then leave them out in March. Oh. And so it creates, yeah. And sort of like a mini greenhouse. Yeah, kind of, yeah. And so they've, been, they've done okay in like those temperatures. I've talked to, to a few people who have done you know, their seeds like that because that's how they start their tomatoes or whatever for their garden. Um, so, yeah, it's, uh, they're hardy enough being a, a native plant and, and sourced here in New Brunswick that I think that they can take some experimenting weather-wise. And then I know you just jump in, maybe last question, just so I can wrap up and you guys can chat afterwards. Yeah. Only one more question? <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> Got a whole list here. Um, which would most important? Oh, uh, this is just a quick one, so it won't be. Uh, old records for from I naturalists for monarchs are okay. Oh yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that would be great. Okay, good. so that doesn't count as a question. <laughs> um, I don't know if you're aware. There's a really sort of a neat board game called Mariposa that goes through. Uh, it's made by the same people who made Wingspan. Anybody? Oh, yes, yes, I have heard of this. Yeah, um, and yeah. it, you get into the generations and you've got to get your butterflies back to Mexico. And, yeah. And uh, so it, it's really quite fun if you're into board games. Even that. if you're not into board games, yeah. it's fun. A coworker of mine was just. Okay, anyone else have a last question? <laughs> I'm, I have more for you. Okay. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, thanks. I, I think she did say she can stick around yeah. for a little bit. So, yeah, if anybody would like to ask more questions, it'd be great. Uh, but just to wrap up our, our formal part of the presentation there, um, you know, thank you so much for this fantastic presentation. Um, really interesting to learn about, you know, monarch butterflies and some of the work being done in our, in our region to help protect them and specifically through nature and being. Great. Thanks so much. <laughs> and so just a few uh, closing remarks. Uh, that wraps up today's speaker series. Thank you to everyone who participated, including our speakers. Uh, the work that they're all doing is truly inspiring. Uh, so thank you for your contributions and for taking time out of your busy schedules uh, to speak here today. Uh, a few items before closing. And so these presentations have been recorded and will be uploaded to Cape Tremaine's website and YouTube page. So if you missed any of them uh, and would like to watch them again, then they will be made available for future viewing. Hopefully I'll have them up within the, the next couple of weeks as time permits. And I would like to note that Cape Germain Nature Center is a nonprofit organization that relies on the generous support of the public to keep us operational. And so if you'd like to, you can donate in person or on our website. Uh, you can also sign up for a $20 membership, which provides access to uh, the Cape Germain newsletter, free access to parking and voting privileges at our general meetings. Uh, any support is greatly appreciated. And this event was funded by the New Brunswick Environmental Trust Fund uh, in Environment and Climate Change Canada. Thank you both for making this event possible. And also a huge thank you uh, to Cape Germain staff, the Cape Germain Board of Directors, the Canadian Wildlife Service, and everyone who attended here today. Thank you all for supporting us, and we hope to see you again in the future. And just a reminder for, for those of you here that are remaining, please do feel free to stick around to, to chat and to have a bit of a look around Cape Germain. Thank you so much. Thank you.